Sol System, Orbit of Jupiter, Terran Republic Senate Station, Early 2669, Fleet Admiral Octavia, Admiral of the Stellar Fleet. Octavia walked the halls of a grand chamber, filled with granite and marble, as people walked in all manner of directions. The sounds of her footwear resonated with the polished marble at her feet, as it did with every other footstep throughout the hall. She was in the Terran Republic Senate headquarters in orbit of Jupiter. It was a grand facility in orbit of their largest gas giant and had its own detachment of ships and defences, only second to Terra itself. Since it was home to the Senate that represents all Terran systems, security was a must. As such, security detail was seen posted at several checkpoints and entrances sporting armour similar to the Marines, but were tinted with navy blue on the composite armour, and the letters TRSC were lasered on the front and back of the chest. She continued walking when she reached an office that led to one of the docking ports on the far edge of the station. The glass plane that was on her right revealed a steel-grey ship, smaller than a corvette, but larger than some heavy and large ships. It was her government-issued ship, and with it came its own escort, worthy to take on some of the larger pirate fleets she'd seen. As she made her way to the gate, she was stopped and screened by security. Even as the highest rank in the military for her branch, she was still subject to searches and scans. She could be the Terran Chancellor, and you would still be searched for contraband. She recognised their tight adherence to protocol and let them do their jobs. As they finished, she made her way into the office just past the gate, where she was met with a familiar face. We ready to go or what, Juna? The man said nonchalantly. Instead of a vacuumed suit, like most of the civilians, he wore the standard ODR battle dress with silver markings on his pauldrons that shone from the overhead lights, and instead of a helmet, he had a cap that matched the grey and steel camo theme of his uniform underneath the armour. It's Octavia in public, Titus, she returned with a sneer. Fine, fine, Octavia. Are we ready to go or do you need time to change? replied the General of the Raiders. I'm fine as I am. It's best we leave now. Is our escort ready? she replied. He nodded as he stood, using his arms as support from his seat. They're ready. We were just waiting on you. They passed through the docking tube to their ship. It was long and windows lined the sides of it, revealing parts of the station and the whole of Jupiter, with a big red spot looming in its atmosphere, like an eye peering at her from below. They were then met at the end by a pair of raiders that stood at attention upon their arrival and opened the doors to the ship. Titus and Octavia rendered a salute in response as they entered through the ship's doors. They were subsequently followed, and they took their post at inside of the ship beside the docking entrance. The ship was luxurious in design, with black polished flooring and white sleek designs for the walls. They walked forward and were met with an open concept central chamber with overhead ship-grade glass. The scene was serene and quiet, with the curvature of Jupiter, in all its glory, helping illuminate the central chamber. They then made their way up the stairs that lined the sides of the chamber toward the bow. They passed an area where food and drinks were served, and into a room with a long table that could fit ten, one on each end and four on the long sides of the table. It was empty, and only Octavia and Titus were present. The room had glass run around the entirety of the room, revealing a new facet of scenery, although it was more of the same at this point, but spectacular nonetheless. Titus then brought up a device from one of his cargo pouches and talked into it. We're ready to depart. Take us to Hades. Sounds of affirmation were sounded, and the ship began its disengagement protocol from the docks. The ships rocked slightly, and the ship started its route. Paired with it were two corvettes, a squadron of medium fighters, and a heavy frigate. Octavia spoke, soon after ordering from one of the waiters that worked the bar. Tell me, Titus, what do you think of this new race? He poured a drink from a bottle of whiskey into a small glass before answering. They could have been great friends. Instead, they chose the path of destruction, he said, taking a sip. I couldn't agree more, Octavia replied. However, you know what the Senate said. We are authorised to essentially slaughter their entire people in retaliation. Hell, the authorisation of the Affent round was generous as is. I was surprised they let you squids use such a round. I'm just waiting for them to mobilise all the ODR. They're itching for a fight, 
added Titus. Well, what about your 4th Battalion? They seem like the most bloodthirsty out of all your battalions, especially Raptor Company, replied Octavia. Titus chuckled at the notion. A hint of pride was apparent in his laugh. There's a reason I sent them, Titus started, after taking a second sip from his glass. Raptor Company is the longest-running company of raiders with the most experience under their belt. And the same can be said for the other companies of the 4th, officially anyway. But the reason I sent Raptor ahead is because of their company commander. And who did you send that you felt was the best choice to head an assault on a foreign entity? She questioned. Her food came, and she started eating, waiting for a response. A lieutenant, he started, gauging her reaction, which showed she nearly choked on her first bite. A lieutenant, in charge of spearheading the ground assault? Why the hell didn't you send over a seasoned major or lieutenant colonel? She inquired, not sure how sending a lieutenant to head an important offensive was an apt choice in commanding officer. OK, I'm going to stop you right there because, well, we don't get many O4s and 5s who last long in the Raiders. They always switch branches once they hit O4, so we've adapted to delegating a lot of responsibility to the lower-ranked officers. And let me tell you, O'Brien is one of the best Raiders I have. He'll get the job done, enough for us to launch an invasion of their home. You place an awfully lot of faith in him, she replied. Well, he has the highest rate of completion for missions and a fierce loyalty to those he protects and serves with. His methods may be questionable, but they are effective, especially where lives of fellow Terrans are concerned. She conceded to his arguments, now changing the topic to the reason they were together in the first place. I'm told we have some POWs, is that correct? she inquired. That's right, we rerouted them from heading to the Red Cross under the guise of volatile temperaments and supposed lethality. We even have the eggheads running tests and analysis. Now is the perfect time to break morality and learn about our enemy inside and out. She agreed with his logic. When it came to light that humanity was not the only sentient species, the Senate was ecstatic. That was short-lived, however, when it was revealed to them the kinds of atrocities they did on first contact. Humanity has fought against itself for so long that it was a wonder how they were able to achieve commercialised space flight. Talks came that perhaps we were the first to initiate hostile contact, but it was quickly stomped out by the video evidence from a lone pilot that managed to barely survive them. The Secretary-General of the Republic quickly set in motion to reinforce our borders and called for the production of more ships. They've enlisted the help of civilians with last-gen military ships in addition to the militias. Humanity was at war, and right now, a single battle group was waging war across their systems. During all this, she was introduced to new technology that could revolutionise their own. The key was Athena and Minerva. She was briefed on the creation of Athena after the Battle of Draxis. But the issue of Minerva arose when it was found out she had budded from her parent programme, Athena. She wasn't the only one thinking it, but if they could replicate that process, they could recreate a new classification of AI and do away with the personal assistant style present on all ships to date. Not only that, but she would have to wait for the conclusion of their war, for that the opportunity to present itself. And from what she was told, the programme that calls itself Minerva had wreaked havoc on the enemy's cyber department. The trip took approximately a week in slipspace, and they slept in cryogenic pods to speed up their perception of time. When they were released, they received a call over the intercom that they were approaching Hades Station. Titus was found putting a cap over his head with his armour still equipped as they readied for their process onto the station. Approaching Hades Station, the shuttle is ready for you. They made their way one level up and toward the aft section of the ship, where they were met with a small shuttle. It had one seat for a pilot and six seats in the aft compartment. They wandered onto the ramp and took their seats while accompanied by a pair of raiders, who took their seats closest to the doors in the shuttle. They lifted off with the hangar doors opening from above, but not much could be seen except for the pilot's seat and from a small viewport from the ramp door. The trip took no longer than several minutes when they landed in a hangar, and the rear ramp opened with a hiss followed by a dull thump. They departed the shuttle and were met with a dreary scene. 
Hades Station was embedded in a large asteroid within the rings of a gas giant. It was made several centuries ago, sometime after humanity was sufficient in faster-than-light travel. The hangar they found themselves in was dilapidated, and workers dressed in orange were seen cleaning the panels while watched by a set of guards with their weapons at the ready. They made their way to the central pair of doors that led into processing. As they made their way, before they reached the doors, they opened and a man in a lab coat approached them. Good day, I'm Dr Hale, chief scientist here at Hades Station. Come, come, I know why you are here. He led them past security and they walked through a small tunnel where they were stopped shortly after reaching the end. It wasn't so much Octavia, but Titus. Sir, the knife, one of the guards said, pointing to his rear. Oh, right, forgot, he said, as he drew the knife from its sheath from the back of his chest armour that was placed near the lower back. Armour stays on, though. The guard nodded silently and placed the knife in a bin and given to a clerk behind him, and the three continued down a hallway. To their right was a series of cells with individuals clad in yellow that could be seen from a raised walkway. They were human, and some would have their yellow jumpsuits rolled halfway, as they did various activities. Here is the main block. Prisoners here are mostly pirates and smugglers. We have them working the asteroid for minerals at a snail's pace until they serve their time or die. Sometimes they really do get forgotten, Dr Hale spoke with unprompted disregard. They moved on beyond the areas with the human prisoners before they made their way to a door at the very end of the long hallway. Beyond here is what you're here for. The sign above the doors was labelled as the laboratories. Octavia remembered Titus's words about finding out about the enemy both inside and out. It made her shiver, but understood that it was necessary. They entered and walked past another tier of security when they were met with a hallway that extended to the left and right, with one side being all glass that peered out into the exhibits of alien prisoners. They call themselves Cellians, but I'm sure you knew that already. Hale spoke as they took the route to the right. From our dissections, they're not very different from us anatomically. They have a heart, a pair of lungs and so on. They are the same in that sense. He continued on the makeup of their biology. They were carbon-based and they breathed our air in similar portions to Earth. Of course, this much was disclosed after Draxis. The conditions the Cellians were subject to were indeed horrible. But there was one emotion that overtook Octavia, and it was disgust. She was well versed in what they did to their first two systems, and was recently briefed that they had taken human slaves, and knew what they could be subject to. As a result, she held no particular empathy for their prisoners. When Hale stopped, they were met with a pair of doors beside one another. They entered the closest one, and it was dimly lit with a table and some chairs. The only light provided came from a pane of glads from the room opposite of them, with a singular entity that was chained to a seat. Octavia then asked, Who's this? Apparently he was a recently promoted chief captain that was captured during the battle over Tola in the Verbus system, our latest conquest. Can it understand me? Titus asked, to which Hale nodded. Yes, sir. They have a translator around their neck that can translate in real time. Turns out they had our language passed after Dima. Titus groaned and stated that he would enter. Hale happily obliged, and both he and Octavia remained in the dimly lit booth. They saw him enter, and the Cellian squirmed in his seat, the chains rattling as he did so. Well, well, well. Not so good being on the opposite end now, are we? He was the first to speak, but the Cellian remained silent. You know, there's a lot we don't know about each other. How about we introduce ourselves? You can call me Titus. And you are? The alien waited a moment before speaking. I am Dalagon, chief captain to the Cellian fleets. I'm going to get straight to the point, Dalo. My people would like to know where our people were taken and who took them. He was silent, but he began to repeat his introduction before being promptly silenced with a backhand from Titus. He recoiled and blood dripped from its mouth and a new wound generated from the strike. He then grabbed the Cellian by the head, gripping his hand over it like a ball. Tell me what I need to know, and maybe I can stop. When he didn't respond, Titus began with one of his digits and broke it backward to a position unnatural. Delogan screamed and cycled his breathing, trying to maintain consciousness. 
As Titus was prepared to break the second finger, Dalogan squeaked out a barely audible whisper. Ta, Tosca. Titus leaned in. I need more than that, my friend. Who are they? What do they do? This time he spoke in a soft and comforting tone. It looked like tears were beginning to form in the eyes of the Celian. Slavers. For the Union. He began to cry. Please, I, I have a family. Titus took to a seat in a chair opposite Dalagon and spoke to him in the same manner. I got to tell you, Dalo, those people that were taken had families too. Husbands, wives, mothers, daughters, sons, grandparents, except you want to know what we got from one of your raids. Dalo shook his head. Instead, he just listened, pain apparent on his face. All the while, Octavia looked coldly at the interaction. We saw you kill the elderly, the sick, the men. Your people took the women and children to God knows where. No, I want you to tell me where they might have gone, Darlow. You don't want something bad to happen to your crew, do you? He fervently shook his head no and tried to speak. T the Tosca. They're slavers from the Union. They run the border between us and the Union. I swear that's all I know. D don't hurt them. You see, that might be kind of hard to do. I need something more. Something you're not telling me, Titus said as he reclined in his seat. I swear, I only followed orders. I don't even know where they would take them. Titus sighed at his reply. That's not what I need, Dalo. Then let's make this easy. Who gave the order? With that, Dalo's expression sealed and he hung his head low. He decided to remain loyal and stopped talking. Octavia recognised that beating him any more would probably result in stern silence, and she was sure Titus knew this as well. However, his next tactic would throw Octavia severely off guard. Looks like beating you won't really make you talk. Not like it actually works, he said, while requesting a pad that had a live feed to the human inmates. You see, interrogations with violent bodily harm really don't yield much benefits. I've tried to be nice, but you just like to be quiet. Breaking two fingers probably hurts too. I would know. He tapped away on the pad, and Octavia and Hale could only watch. Perhaps the well-being of your compatriots might yield some incentive. He turned on the monitor behind him, facing the Celian. It was the inmates they had passed earlier, donning the yellow jumpsuits. You know, human prisons can be a wild place. Hierarchies are made by making others submit, either through violence or sexual. The Celian squirmed some more in his seat, but still chose to remain silent. And from what I've seen and heard, anatomically, you're very similar. He turned on the volume, and the everyday clamour of the inmates could be heard. Dalo's eyes darted around the screen with urgency. Tell me who ordered the making of slaves of Terrans, his yell reverberated in the small room. When he was met with silence, he proceeded with his plan. The doors on the screen opened with a buzz, and the camera panned to the door. A lone female Celian was pushed through the door. She still wore her jumpsuit, but instead of yellow, it was orange. The guards that pushed her through retreated back through the doors. The eyes of the inmates turned to her with a predatory stare. You see, normally we have laws against this sort of thing. You can't really have women in the same prison space as men. Because then, he pointed to the yellow shirts, they haven't spoken to a woman, let alone see one so close. But as far as I'm aware, most of our laws only apply to us, not you. And the cordial attitude we have with your people... The civilians is nothing more than a courtesy. He spoke into the microphone on the data pad as the inmates stared at the female, not knowing if it was a test. You have ten minutes! Dalo squirmed harder in his seat and started to yell, begging him to stop. S stop! You can't do this! Titus delivered another backhand to Dalagan. Then give me names! After a few minutes, the yells of the female were apparent over the speakers, forcing Dalagon to concede. Torlak and the War Council! He was the one who made the initial order, and he was backed by the Council to take slaves. Please stop them! Titus pressed a button, and the guards that initially forced the female through rushed the group with ferocity, beating away the convicts with metal batons and taking the female away before retreating behind the door she had come through. I... I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Dalagon repeated, until Titus left the room with the sobbing Celian and returned to Octavia and Hale. Well, I doubt that was legal, she said, her face emotionless. 
but I guess it worked, so I can't complain. We have a solid lead and one of the perpetrators to bring down. I'm going to send word and update target dossiers for the 4th Battalion. Besides, it's not like they made much of her. He revealed the female he used for the interrogation on his datapad. The top portion of her clothing was ripped off, but the lower half of the jumpsuit remained intact. Talk about trauma, Octavia said, as they continued towards the shuttle. And I'm surprised they let a general of the ODR interrogate. We swapped it out with a sturdier fabric. Any longer and she really would have been in trouble. Besides, I own this station, he said, placing a cap on his head. Have we received word on the authorization of the TRU task forces? No, not yet. They might authorise it if we can capture both the War Council and this General Torlak. Until then, we will have to wait. Titus sighed and turned to the doctor. Keep doing your work with the Cellians and report back to me when you have more intel. Physical and mental limits. Their genome, all of it. You won't have long before the Senate outlaws your practice on the Cellians. The doctor nodded and saw them off as they entered the ship along with their escorts. Think we can recover all who were taken as slaves? Octavia asked of Titus, as he wiped his hands with a cloth to free them from Cellian blood. All I know is that we have orders to decimate their army in any way we can, and I intend to have my men act on those orders, unless told otherwise, replied the general. Octavia conceded and rested in her seat for the upcoming trip back to the Senate. At whatever the cost, she mouthed in a whisper audible only to her. To First Lieutenant O'Brien, 4th ODR Battalion Raptor Company. Orders. You and your company are authorized to engage with lethal force on any and all hostile forces. You are to deny them from reorganization by any means necessary using only conventional standards. Further orders will be issued upon the launch of Operation Spearhead. Weapons are free when boots hit the ground. You will also receive additional reinforcements from the 4th Battalion's Cobra, Viper, and Raven Company. More soon to follow. End. From General Titus, Brook General of the ODR.